Hello and welcome to this video. This is Corey from the Box Caller YouTube channel and the WellRoundedPianist.com. This is the third video now in my series on Wim Winters and his double beat theory. And um, this is, I'm, I, I have a list here, just some things uh, that perhaps I did address in other videos but maybe want to uh, address again. Uh, this hopefully this will be a little shorter video and I'll you know start to get to the points on these these issues instead of rambling so much um, okay first of all first of all I, I never I never put in any ad hominem attacks on Wim okay I think Wim Winters is an excellent musician he has beautiful instruments I especially enjoy his, his Clementi uh, Opus 36 Sonatinas played on the clavichord, which I recently viewed. I, I really like that. It, Wim is an is a excellent performer. So there, there's nothing wrong with, with Wim Winters as a performer. I'm not bashing Wim Winters as a performer. Okay, that's a different topic. What I'm talking about here is this crazy double beat or half beat theory, whatever you want to call it, which in my view is, is I've told you before, it's ridiculous. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't hold water. This is what I'm attacking. I'm not attacking Wim. Okay, Wim, Wim is a great musician and, and I applaud him for his many high quality videos he puts out and especially for the the Clementi Sonatinas, which I which I especially liked on the clavichord. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to clear up. The second thing is I have a list here. Um, <clears throat> okay, composers. Composers, in in the way I see it, the historical performers such as Wim and, and others, people from all the camps, all the various sort of sub-camps in the historical performance uh, world. The way I understand it is that they view composers as something like infallible gods, incapable of making mistakes. Their works cannot be questioned. Nothing they do can be questioned. They're you know, up here, they're gods and we're not. And if we dare question anything, oh my gosh, you know, we, we not do that. That's, that's the problem I have. That's the biggest problem I have with the historical tempo movement and all the other sort of sub-movements in the historical performance world. Composers are not gods. They're not infallible. They're human beings. Human beings make errors, and human beings make mistakes. Okay, I'm not saying that composers make mistakes with their notes and their rhythms and their harmonies. Okay, they're, I probably, you know, I've probably found, you know, just a handful of mistakes, what I consider to be mistakes in uh, the great composer's works. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, metronome speeds and the assigning of speeds. Now, I've worked with contemporary composers before. I've played a lot of new music in my day. And uh, composers are willing to bend for their metronome marks. It's very quite common a composer will put a metronome speed on their music and the performer, whoever's performing it, will go through it and discover that, you know, maybe they it's just too fast to musically make sense of it, and they'll ask the composer, like I've done that before, ask them, well, what do you think about a slower speed? And the composers usually always bend. They don't, they're, they're, they don't, uh, it's very rare you'll find a composer who, who, who steadfastly says, no, I want that speed and that speed only. So let's say if a composer writes 80 and they, let's say it's better musically at 60 when the performer is working on his, his works, then the composer usually will have no problem with going down to 60 from 80. I mean, it's a pretty big difference. 
I'm a composer. I'm a comp not a huge, you know, I don't put out work after work, but I'm a composer and I'm an arranger. And if somebody, if, if a pianist came along and took my works and played them or played a piece much slower or much faster than my metronome mark says on it, because I do try to give metronome speeds, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't care. I'm just happy to have people play my music. So I'm not going to make a big deal and a big fuss if a performer performs my music differently than the way I conceived it or the way that I, I perform it myself. It's not a big issue. If it's not a big issue now, why would it be a big issue in 1820 or 1830? It wouldn't. That's the thing. Composers are not infallible gods. They're human. They're willing to bend a little bit. And um, as I pointed out and really tried to make clear in my last video about the Rachmaninoff elegy analogy, Rachmaninoff recorded his elegy very fast and most people play it much slower. You know, who's right? The composer or the performers? We can't say. We can't say who's right. If you say, well, only Rachmaninoff is right, then that invalidates Gavrilov and Horowitz and everybody else who's all the great Russian pianists who have recorded his works much slower than Rachmaninoff, or vice versa. You know, so it's, it's really, um, <laughs> it's really a, a messy situation when you get into when you claim or imply or think that composers are infallible gods. So, that being the case, uh, it, is, it is best to question composers' metronome marks. They must always be questioned. Also, here's another thing. When you see a metronome mark on a piece, like on Bergmuller or whatever. You need to ask where that came from. Did that mark come from the composer or did it come from the publisher? We don't know. Some, maybe sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But you need to figure that out. If the, if the metronome marks came from the publisher, then, well, we have a big problem here because publishers are business people. They're not performers, or maybe they, some might be. But, you know, you're, you're, you're walking on fire now if you try to put stock in metronome marks that are given by business people in an office situation. They, they want to publish works and sell a lot of copies, so they, they put speeds on there. That could very well be the case in a lot of music, but we need to do further research on that. Even if, even if it were proven that the composers themselves put those speeds on the music, like I said, I go back to my Rachmaninoff elegy analogy. Who's to say that the composer's tempo is the best tempo? Really, quite honestly. Composers, composers are great composers. They know how to compose music. They're not always the best judges of the best way to perform their music. Usually in our day and age, from the 1800s to the 1900s to the 20th century, most of the time, if there is, if there has been a sort of definitive performer for some composer's works, it's, it's almost never the, by the composer. So if you have a definitive, I, I can't think of any examples right now, but it's, it's usually performers perform, composers compose. I mean, there are composer performers, but by and large, comp the, the most definitive performances of most composers' works are done by other people other than the composers. So that being the case, wouldn't it stand to reason that the 
performers, a reputable and professional performer who knows what they, they're doing, wouldn't it stand to reason that they would be actually more experts on those works than the composers themselves? The performers spend hours and hours on their work. So composers just write the piece, write the sonata or whatever, and they're done. They don't go back. You know, if we had to resurrect Beethoven today, I highly doubt that he could sit down and play even half of his sonatas without much, you know, he couldn't just sit down and just whip off his sonatas. Chopin could not sit down and play all his etudes if we resurrected it. He could not. Perhaps at a slow speed or something. But, you know, we're, we're putting too much stock in the abilities of composers. Uh, composers are not superhuman. Okay, they're not superhuman, they're not infallible, and they're not gods. Performers are the ones, usually, who determine things and determine traditions. It's not composers. Therefore, it's the performers, usually, who determine the tempo traditions, not the composers. And so to put so much stock in metronome marks that are, that are written by composers is to play with fire. It's to put hope in nothing, because it means nothing. Metronome marks are numbers on a page. Okay, so let's say... Um, Oh, I have a note here. Well, let's say Schubert were resurrected. Okay, Franz Schubert, he, we were able to resurrect him. He was cryogenically frozen, and we resurrected him today. And uh, Schubert sat down at the piano and uh, played, uh, let's say he, he played some of his piano sonatas. And we take his tempi for his, his movements of the piano sonatas. Our, is is are those the only authentic or historical tempi for those works? No, absolutely not. Like the Rachmaninoff analogy, there's lots of different ways, or lots of different speeds at which you can play composer's music. I'm, I'm, I highly doubt that Schubert could even play all his sonatas, really, quite honestly. I don't think he could. If we resurrected Schubert, he could not sit down and play all of his piano sonatas. Composers are composers. Performers are performers. We have to go more by reputable, reputable performers and their traditions more so than just composers and what they write. But even so, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that those extremely fast metronome marks are valid. No, I don't believe those are valid either. I don't, you know, as I've made clear in my former videos, the, the uh, single beat tempo and the half beat tempo, as I've shown, are very often both incorrect. So, whether it's whether those speeds were given by the composers or by the publishers or by performers or whoever, they're just not good. They're, they're, they're not good numbers. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of thought and a lot of care and a lot of, a lot of thinking to put a good metronome mark on a piece of music. You don't just do it in a couple minutes. You have to put it there and then maybe play it through or conduct it through and then the next day go back to it and test it out and see and then you know I've had to do this many times I've changed my mind on Tempe for my own works and uh, you know I've changed my mind I've played it at such and such tempo uh, one day and then three months later when I'm toying with it again I'll you know play it at a, a rather different speed you know, my own works played by, by me. So, you know, composers are human beings. They're not infallible gods. Now, that being said, a lot of people are aware of my Bach tempo theory, which I haven't really totally made public yet, but it's not, I don't want to get into that so much right now. But I want to mention that because 
when I was in graduate school and developing my Bach tempo theory, I ran into the same problem as Wim. And fellow students and even professors thought I was, uh, I was like, I was like the Wim Winters of, of my graduate school. Um, you know, I, I had this idealistic theory about Bach's music. You know, Bach planned such and such tempi for his works, so forth. If you play any other tempo, you're wrong. All that, all that stuff. You know, I still believe that. I still believe 100% in my Bach tempo theory, which is not public yet, totally. Um, but here's the thing: it's different. My theory of Bach's tempi and my uh, research in Baroque tempi is different than what Wim and other historical tempo people are doing now. The difference is that I will be the first to admit that sometimes I perform or play box pieces at a speed different than I think Bach planned. Okay, so for example, um, the first fugue from Book One of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Okay, according to my research, uh, it should be 54 beats per minute per quarter note. Like that. So, 54. And that results in one of the reasons, because it results in a time of exactly two minutes, if done, uh, if done at that speed. It could be a little longer with a little retard at the end. But basically, my theory boils down to Bach had uh, time constraints or time parameters for his music. And that fugue is a perfect example of that. It's a, what I call the two-minute rule. And so 54 beats per minute I chose for that fugue because, uh, because of that rule. I'll get into that later. I don't want to really get into that now. I'll do that in, in future videos or include some of that in my book. But I'll be the first to admit that even though Bach planned that fugue to be 54 beats per minute and to last two minutes for, for an entire performance, I'll play it really slow. In fact, I think I've recorded it really slow, or slower than that. Sounds beautiful that way. I like, I like to play it really slow. Let's see what that speed was. Dun, dun. That was around 42. That was considerably slower than the 54 that Bach planned. So if I were to teach this to a student, usually they can't play it at 54, so I have them slow it down, and then I'll play it through slow, and I'll say, wow, this sounds really beautiful at that really slow speed. But I'm willing to admit I know that that's an incorrect speed, historically or theoretically. That's an incorrect speed. I know that. But I can still make it beautiful nevertheless. The point I'm trying to make is that my, in my Bach tempo theory, which you'll hear about later, I, it's, I'm very strict with it. In fact, probably even more strict than Wim is on, on his tempo uh, historical tempo theory. But I am willing to bend just for artistic reasons when I'm playing pieces. So there's a difference between, between th theoretically and historically correct and just doing things because you want to do something slower or faster just to be artistic or something or to be different or because you feel like doing it slower or faster. That, that's the difference between my Bach tempo theory and Wim's theory. So the conclusion is, I hope I made it very clear, that metronome speeds, whether they're given by composers or publishers or, or performers, uh, metronome speeds 
given in most music in the 19th century and the 20th century are pretty much meaningless. They're, they really mean nothing because there is such a wide range of, of possibilities of performers and composers and people playing those, those works that it, it just it cancels out any importance for the metronome speeds, either the full beat or the half beat. So don't put so much stock and so much, so much uh, um, trust in numbers on a page. They're just numbers. Remember, composers are human beings. They're not infallible gods, and they, they change their minds, and they, they're, 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 they're a little um, flaky about some things. Uh, change their minds, do it this way, do it this way. Yes, composers compose music, performers perform, and it's for us to figure out what is authentic for a piece of music for us today. Because there really is no such thing as a historical tempo or an authentic tempo because it, it just, there is such a, a large range. So I hope that, that this gave you some ideas, uh, maybe perhaps some new ideas on uh, how to view this situation, this uh, controversial issue of tempo. And uh, once again, uh, congratulations to Wim on his, on his nice uh, videos and his well thought out performances and his beautiful instruments. I'm attacking the theory, I'm not attacking the person. So until we meet again.